Tick tock, time to rock. How's everyone doing? Gave Anthony all day to come up with a topic. <laughs> I never what know what lie David's going to start out with. Mm. So uh, anyway, uh, I have had some requests for just um, Q and A. So decided to go with a Q and A today. So. <clears throat> Anyone who's got any questions, before we even start off, why doesn't everyone tell me where you're watching from? You'll see Anthony has on his... <clears throat> I see you sort of leaning back, Anthony, so people can see I did your, that now that your, you said something. Your National the, Sarcastic Society shirt. I should have an arrow pointing at you. <laughs> All right, so ladies and gentlemen, we're going to have Q&A. Why doesn't everyone tell us where you're coming from? And then... Any questions you might have about anything we've covered in our videos, questions about Islam, Christianity, anything else. And we'll go ahead and uh, take questions for a little while, talk about anything you guys want to talk about. Um, again, we're here because Anthony came for a little visit because he wants to record some videos. My equipment is way better than his recording equipment, so when we want some really high resolution. So by the way, anyone wants to ever get Anthony a bunch of awesome new equipment so he can uh, have awesome videos where he's from. And what do you record on? You record on like your, your webcam? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I use a webcam or I use my cell phone. But the part of the, the, one of the bigger issues is the lighting. <clears throat> I'm over there in my... It's my library, but it's a. You don't have you don't you don't have studio lights. No, you got nothing. You got you nothing that. that you need. Now I tell people when they're getting when they're getting started on YouTube, don't worry about equipment. Uh, just because you can record on a uh, cell phone if you need to, you can get a you can get a twenty dollar mic that'll plug into your cell phone and give you even better um, audio. So you don't need and you don't uh, need anything sophisticated to get started on YouTube. Uh, but obviously, if we're posting stuff for my channel, it's got to be pretty good because p people will complain about anything they can complain about you know what i mean mm -hmm. and like if uh if i'm recording and i'm recording i usually record in 4k but then i reduce it to 1k just because it's uh you don't you don't need 4k for most stuff but uh if i'm recording in in 4k and you know making it making it 1k and then you're recording in like 480 people will, will will complain about that even though even though content is king and it's the quality of the content that matters people will complain about stuff so Anyway, long story short, Anthony comes up here. I'll record all his stuff, nice and professionally, and then uh, and then we've got some awesome videos. Um, where is everyone from here? <clears throat> so <clears throat> let's see what we've got here. We've got North Carolina. I was actually born in North Carolina, Fayetteville, Indiana, mm -hmm. USA, Candace, Virginia, um, Bacon One Two Three, UK, GK from Montreal, Rima. Vancouver, Canada, Columbus, Ohio, Malaysia, BC, Canada, Toronto, Quebec, Canada. A lot of Canadians. Ottawa, Canada. Why so many people from Canada? Seems like more people from Canada than the uh, than the U.S. We got Washington State, um, Poland, Roanoke, Virginia. That's a couple of Virginias so far. Athens. Another Poland, Trinidad, Nigeria, Texas, Northern Virginia, San Francisco Bay Area, England, Trinidad. Gosh, it is late in England, in England and Poland. It's the middle of the night there. Lebanon, very Japan, late there. Hawaii, San Antonio, Seattle, the great state of Texas, Australia, Georgia, Europe. Seno Badua said, can you pronounce my name? Well, I can say, I can sort of sound it out, but probably correctly, no. Um, Portugal, Milwaukee, India, Paris, Texas. Um, <clears throat> Albania, UK, Philly, London, Toronto, Stan, <laughs> New Zealand, <laughs> Texas. All right, so it, it kind of doesn't matter what time of the day we go live. People still watch from all over the world. I guess they're, they're even in Europe or the Middle East, there is there are still plenty of people who stay up in the middle of the night. And so, so I guess, I guess, 
I'm guessing uh, that probably increases during coronavirus pandemic when more people probably uh, their sleep. I know my sleep schedule's off. I'm up till like five in the morning and then I sleep till like noon. All right. Uh, <clears throat> I just saw a question about street preaching. All right. Wait, matter of fact, let me see if I can get this up on the screen. Because I have the technology. Wow, Israel, Indonesia, still popping up. <laughs> Saved by Grace says Australia doesn't exist. <laughs> you can make you can make arguments like that uh, for discussions with atheists to find out or how flat how skeptical. Yeah. Um, let's see where that question was. Question about street preaching, and then. <laughs> Rabbit Wolf said, "Help! I'm being held hostage in California by a group of by a group of megalo megalomaniacal, megalomaniacal power hungry autocrats." I was born and raised in California, so North Carolina. You have to account for David. <clears throat> um, California gets to celebrate that I was born there, and that's where you were a gangster. Mm. How good it. By the way, in case in case anyone's new here, Anthony used to be a, a professional car thief. So, uh, how good were you at stealing cars? How long would it take you if you saw a car that you wanted to steal? How long does it take you from the time you decide you're stealing this car, you're right beside it, to actually driving off in it? What's it take? Is it like so five minutes or is it like... It, it depends on what kind of car and how you're stealing it. Initially, when I first started stealing cars, I would steal cars with, with tilt steering. The tilt steering cars like Grand Ams, Cadillacs, that sort of thing, if you bust the steering column, it exposes the uh, mechanism by which you, when you turn the key, it's moving something. So you, you break the steering column, the outer casing, and then you uh, pop out a ball that locks the steering wheel when, when, you know, how it locks the steering wheel. You pop that out and then you're able to just move the lever. So that, that could be a very quick process. Uh, unless you're trying to be really quiet, you don't want people to hear, you can, you know, do it uh, real gently. But what I eventually started doing was taking people's cars out of their garages. And actually, this is a lesson to everybody that has uh, a garage. Ordinarily, when people park in their garage, their, their mentality is, we don't use our keys to open our front door. We only use our keys for our cars. So they just leave their keys in their, in their car in the garage. And so a thief knows that if I can get into the garage, I can steal that car because that's where the keys are. So if you leave your garage open on top of it, all a person has to do is run up in your garage, open the car. And I just learned that when uh, half the time when I go into a garage and open the car, I would hear the, and this is what, the reason I first caught on to this was because I went into somebody's garage, I opened the door and I heard the, the noise going off. Beep, 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 mm -hmm. beep, beep, beep. So I knew the keys were in the ignition. And I thought, do people do this all the time? And in fact, a lot of people do it. So init uh, initially I would start stealing cars in a more technical way. And later I just started stealing them with the keys. All right. So anyway, point was, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you got to pay attention for people like Anthony. So don't leave your keys in your car, in, even in your garage. I was 18. That was over 20. years I'm not saying you're still ago. doing it. I'm saying as a lesson... Now, you're, now they're getting the inside scoop from a thief before it ever happens to them so they know what precautions right. to take. A lot of businesses and stuff do that, right? They won't just have some random, you know, they won't have some random security expert come in. They'll have someone who used to forge bank checks to come in mm -hmm. and tell them how to, how to spot, you know, fake bank ch you know, checks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So now we have the, uh, the stealing cars expert here. What a dirtbag. Anyway. <laughs> <clears throat> we have, uh, God bless you. David, what is your opinion on street, sh street preaching? I'm 17 from the Netherlands, and I will start street preaching. What's your view on street preaching, Anthony? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it, I think it's great. I think people should be doing all sorts of things to engage non-Christians, get the gospel out there. And, but, you, you know, you just take into account the context, where you're at, uh, what you're doing. I know people, one thing I really like is uh, somebody I know goes to uh, Santa Monica, the pier there, they set up, I guess a lot of groups do this, it's in Santa Monica, this is in California, 
they have a mic that they're using and then they have another mic that anybody else can come up to and, and ask questions on. Mm -hmm. So he'll say stuff, he'll present slides, he has his own little PowerPoint thing going on there. And over the years, he's developed hundreds and hundreds of slides. So no matter what subject comes up, if somebody brings up uh, you know, Islam, he's got slides for Islam. If somebody brings up Jehovah's Witnesses, he's got slides for that. It doesn't matter what it is. And so he's ready for their questions, but he's also got all the equipment there that, that kind of gives him a, at least a visual advantage, right? So mm -hmm. that's one thing. That's not exactly preaching, but it is uh, he, he's talking and then he's giving other people a chance to, to challenge him and then he'll, he'll respond to them. And that's, that's great. It, it shows people that Christianity has the you know, tools to, to respond to that sort of thing. So I mm -hmm. think that's great. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, my view would be, uh, yeah, whatever you do, whatever you do, do it well, right? If you're going to be a, a street preacher, then do it, do it well, right? So make sure you got your theology down, um, and do, do it in a way, do it in a way that's that's going to stick in people's minds, so that whatever point you're trying to make, uh, you get it into people's minds, and um, probably, uh, probably start watching videos of the world's best street preachers and start seeing how they do things, what, what questions pop up over and over again. And, uh, and then I'm sure you'll, I'm sure you'll learn, you'll learn quickly by practice. Uh, Nem here says any debates on the horizon. You have one coming up. Are you still doing one here yeah. in like a week or something? Well, so, so I am, I forgot to tell you, the guy wanted to change the date a bit. So he wants to do it on June 6th, which is a Saturday at 3 PM. I don't know if that works for you it's coronavirus but, there's nothing going on anywhere <laughs> well i didn't know if maybe you had a uh, another live stream with somebody some other character like alfadi or something like that i don't but, i don't plan that far in, in advance <laughs> oh i know that uh, <laughs> but uh yeah so i have a debate coming up i was trying to get dale tuggy to debate let me get this out there uh you know on the record because dale tuggy has this other narrative going on in his own mind for a number of people, at least his own fan base, that people are avoiding him. So Sam has explicitly challenged Dale Tuggy. He will not debate Sam. He had his excuses. I challenged him to debate. He has some other excuses. Uh, so uh, I do have a debate coming up with a different Unitarian. Uh, very you know nice gentleman. Lives in uh, Czechoslovakia. Is from England. So he he, he speaks uh, you know clear English and so forth, but... Oh, I thought you were about to say, he's, yeah. he lives in England, so he speaks English. I was like, what, what, <laughs> no. what, what language I, did you think we were going to I be mentioned debating? that he's in Czechoslovakia. I didn't want oh. people thinking I'm, oh, okay, I'm going to okay, try okay. and... Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so we're going to debate. His name's L.J. Threepland. Uh, so, yeah, that's coming up June 6th. Okay, so June 6th, Unitarian Debate. Do you guys, what, what what's the, do you have the official title? He of? wants to debate whether or not the angel of the Lord is God, according to the Old Testament, mm -hmm. is Yahweh. Yep. So. Yep, that should be a good one. So, yep, that'll be here on this channel. June, you said 6th? Yes. June 6th. So, yeah, that'll be, and you're supposed to be debating Shabir, but we're kind of not sure how things are going to turn out with the coronavirus. Right. I'm supposed to debate Shabir in California. Yeah, I've been. In I've been, September. I've been asked to do a debate at the same time, but before I'm conform, before I'm confirming anything, I wanna I wanna see how things go out. I don't I don't wanna set things up and then and then it and then it falls. Are through. you so holding? I'm gonna wait a couple more months. Are you holding off on announcing who it is? No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not agreeing to anything until oh, a couple okay. months goes by and, okay. and I find out. You know, things are things are opening up or something like that. Um, <clears throat> here you go. Mihoville P. Why do I get Islamic relief ads all the time on your channel? Well, it's actually it's actually cool. You see, the, the there's an algorithm. There's a YouTube algorithm for deciding where to put which ads based on who's who's watching and so on. So it's actually people complain that they're getting Islamic ads on my videos, but that that's good, right? It means that the algorithm knows that Muslims are watching my videos, and so it's putting Muslim ads because Muslims are watching my videos. So I think I think it's hilarious, and so yeah, and and really, I mean, I mean, a relief organization if they're actually using it for for to to help people, I don't care. I don't care if people give to a to a Muslim charity as long as they're using it for something good, and not using it, you know, funneling money to a terrorist group or something under the under the uh, you know under the undercover. But um, 
Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming these organizations are just, you know, using it and actually doing charity and stuff like that. But anyway, yeah, long story short, long story short, the ads come on my channel because Muslims are watching my videos and the algorithm is sending Muslim ads for all the Muslims who are watching my videos. So it's pretty cool. Um, here we go. Melissa says, I understand why ex-Muslims go from a clearly false faith to atheism, but what do you think is the best argument to believe the gospel rather than being put off by any religion forevermore? Um, so yes, basically what you have, ladies and gentlemen, is there are exceptions. There are exceptions. But generally, when someone leaves Islam, he either goes into the atheist slash agnostic camp or he becomes a Christian. There are exceptions. Farhan Qureshi was one of was one of. Did you ever debate Farhan? No, we interacted okay. a lot though. Okay, yeah. But I know it was surprising where he ended up. Yeah, one one of my one of my earliest debate um, opponents, and in fact, actually, this uh, Farhan was Nabil's first debate. Hmm. Uh, the, the first debate Nabil ever did was uh, against Farhan Qureshi, and I debated Farhan. It must have been, but somewhere between five and seven times. So. And he, he was uh, he was with the Muslim Debate Initiative, the, the Muslim organization, the Muslim Debate Initiative. He was one of the um, uh, two American representatives. So they were uh, Farhan Qureshi and um, was it Shadid? Shadid, Shadid Lewis. And so Farhan eventually left Islam, but he got interested in like Eastern stuff, right? So he's interested in like Hindu Eastern um, religious stuff. So meditating and, and things like that. So, but, but he, but that's the exception. Most people go the atheist agnostic route or the Christian route. And there's, there's actually pretty, pretty good reason for that. If someone, if someone believes in, someone's a Muslim, he's raised a Muslim. He believes in God. He believes in Jesus. He believes in the prophets that we read about in the Bible, uh, believes in miracles, believes you know, that, that God has sent people into the world and will judge the world and all these kinds of things. So if a person believes these things and eventually comes to believe that Muhammad's a false prophet, well, if he says Muhammad's a false prophet, then it's per it's perfectly natural to say, yeah, but I still believe in God. I still believe in, in Jesus. I still believe in all these things. I just, I, I now reject Muhammad. So there... It's, it's quite natural for a person who still believes in God, still believes in Jesus, still believes in miracles to look towards Christianity. Um, the other reaction is, wait a minute, come on. I've been hearing all my life from all these religious people that I'm supposed to believe all these things and it's turned out to be a bunch of nonsense. Do you really expect me to go to jump to another religion where they're going to be spouting a bunch of, you know, a bunch of nonsense as well? No, I'm done with it. And part of the, part of the reason for that is a lot of times the people who are exposing Islam might be atheists. So the people that that Muslim might be listening to before he leaves Islam might be atheists who aren't just telling him that Muhammad's a false prophet. They're telling him, look, religion is a bunch of nonsense that's used to manipulate people and so on. So, uh, yeah, so basically the question is, uh, you know, what, what, what's the best argument to believe the gospel um, for someone who's leaving Islam? So if someone's leaving Islam, and you don't want that person just to become an atheist, what sort of argument would you give? I would probably go with the resurrection. What What's your view, Anthony? Well, yeah, I guess a lot depends on the individual. I mean, if you're, d depending on what their mindset is, what, you know, one of the good questions that's always good to ask is what sort of evidence would be convincing to you for X, Y, or Z? And once you know that, now, of course, you have to evaluate with the, whether the person's being honest, whether they know themselves as well as they think. Right. And, and the the answer they're saying or, or the evidence they're saying would be the most persuasive to them may not actually be all that persuasive. I've heard I've, I've heard atheists, for example, say if God made this uh, bed levitate off the ground or whatever, I'd become a yeah. uh, Christian. Then they'll turn around and, and say, you know, well, maybe, you know, this miracle was just a trick that Jesus performed and there yeah. were wires, you know. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, well, why couldn't you do that with every miracle? But you claim this is what would ultimately change your mm -hmm. mind. So it might take a little work digging mm -hmm. to, to get at what, what's going to really work with this individual. But, uh, you know, it might be the predictive prophecy. Uh, if you know prophecy well, you can make a really good argument for Christianity. You, but you have to be able to show that, it, that what you've got in the Old Testament is something well beyond 
uh, the ambiguous statements of somebody like a Nostradamus that some mm -hmm. people think uh, his quatrains are, are predictive in nature. Uh, uh, you, you need to be able to navigate that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, or the argument for the resurrection, or uh, I, I mean, there's there's just so many things really that you could you could bring in there. Uh, I guess it depends what point they're really challenging or, or where where at. You know, are they are they having trouble with the notion of God's existence? Is it inspired scripture uh, is it a god who's actively involved in and with the world you know so i guess my my response would be dependent on where they're at with that mm -hmm. yeah i would learn the uh, argument for the resurrection it is very important to figure out <clears throat> how skeptical someone is because a lot a lot of a lot of people it doesn't it really doesn't matter what the evidence is and people are being pushed in that direction to the point where lots of atheists are now admitting that no evidence would ever con convince them right so dawkins dawkins said mm -hmm. kind of what you just said he was asked and i've been I, I will have a video out on this probably probably this month but i've been planning it for a while just never got around to making it but uh richard dawkins was asked in an interview with peter bogosian what evidence would if god existed what evidence would convince him that it, that god exists and dawkins said well you know years ago i would have said something like hey if i walk outside and i hear a big booming voice richard dawkins believe in me or something like this something like that and he said but i've come to realize since then that if that did happen the more probable explanation would be that i'm hallucinating mm -hmm. and so these guys sort of went back and forth Richard Dawkins and Peter Bogosian, both of both of these guys are atheists. And they got to the point where they were saying, look, even if we went out and there was a message written in the stars, Richard Dawkins believe in me, we still wouldn't believe it. We still wouldn't believe it. We would just conclude that there are powerful aliens who can do stuff. And so their conclusion with is that even if God existed, there is no evidence that can show you that he exists. And my 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 view would be if you have a methodology that that you could use to rule out anything from ever being proven to you, you, you got a problem with your methodology. And, and to, to give you an example, ladies and gentlemen, there are philosophical positions that are that are kind of similar, but on a different scale. So uh, metaphysical solipsism is the position that I'm the only thing that exists. A, a metaphysical solipsist believes that he's the only thing that exists. Nothing exists outside of him. So he, as far as he as far as what he believes, he looks around and he sees a world out there, but he believes he's just creating this entire world uh, to keep himself entertained. But the world out there does not exist outside of himself. It's just, he invents it just like when you're dreaming, when you're dreaming and you you invent a sort of world that you're in, he, he believes that that's, that's what he's doing. And so he doesn't believe, a metaphysical solipsist, if he were talking to you, would not believe that you actually exist. He would believe that you are a figment of his own imagination for his own entertainment because he's the only thing that exists now if someone believes that he's the only thing that exists and anything that he sees with his eyes or hears with his ears is just something that his own mind is inventing to to keep himself entertained what evidence can you ever give that person to show that he's wrong and that there isn't out a world outside of him There's nothing. There's no evidence you could ever give that person, right? Any evidence you give to you would give to him, he interprets within his own worldview as he's just inventing what you just said to keep himself entertained, right? So there's no evidence you could possibly give him. Guess what? That's the same thing many atheists are doing. They just do it, in, instead of just doing it with themselves, they've done it with the natural world. And so if there were something beyond our world, they would never allow any evidence of it to count against them or to prove them wrong because they would just interpret it as something within uh, something within our world. So even if God wrote a message in the stars, they would interpret it as aliens made that message in the stars. Um, and if, if God appeared before him and started blasting around lightning bolts, they would actually conclude, well, there's an alien that's trying to trick me into believing that God exists, but I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to fall for that trick. Now, Richard Dawkins admitted that. There are other atheists who have admitted that. Peter Atkins admitted that if he died and found himself before the pearly gates, he still would not believe, right? So you have atheists now who are acknowledging no evidence would ever convince them. Guess what? I have I could tell that about them all along, right? I could tell all along that they were like that. Why? Because you see what they do with regular arguments for the existence of God. When you show the insane probabilities of 
you know, the fine tuning of the universe or of life forming and so on. They just go, well, yeah, so what? Um, yeah. It's clear that they're just going to reject the evidence no matter what it is. And so the fact that they're admitting it is cool, but I've always, I've always known that about them anyway. And so what, what you really find among at least certain atheists is that they've invented a methodology that is impervious to evidence while simultaneously claiming that they're just going where the evidence points. And so this kind of has to be exposed because um, their, their method is not what they're saying it is, right? Their method, even in that interview, Richard Dawkins goes, well, I've always paid lip service to the claim that one should go where the evidence. So now he's calling it lip service <laughs> that, he, that he, he's always said, go where the evidence points. Whereas now it's, no, don't go where the evidence points because you have to rule out evidence for things that you don't want to believe in. And so it's interesting stuff. What do you want to say? Yeah, so this actually, I, I think it's just a, a another way of uh, expressing what's been true all throughout the history of philosophy. I think people have these views in terms of which they're uh, excluding contrary evidence and, and only allowing in, in into their uh, thought uh, what already comports with their with their position. But but uh, just to go back, uh, not throughout the whole history of philosophy, but just twenty years ago, I remember reading. Uh, Kai Nielsen in his debate with J.P. Moreland. So they were debating the existence of God, and Moreland's approach is very much like Habermas's approach, where he begins with evidence for the resurrection. So you'd have that difference, right? With uh, Somebody like William Lane Craig would say you begin with arguments for the existence of God, like the Kalam argument, the teleological argument, the moral argument, that sort of thing. And then you move, once you've proven God's existence, you move to the evidence for Christ's resurrection, and then from there to the veracity of Scripture or something like that. Well, Moreland was taking the approach that if you can show that Christ rose from the dead, then you have a good argument for the existence of God. And so he presents all this evidence. It was great evidence. But Kai Nielsen, he, he his initial response is to say, well, I don't know a whole lot about the evidence for the resurrection. You know, he goes, I don't know if it's as good as Moreland saying it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and he goes, but I suspect it isn't. You know, that's his first response, right? Mm -hmm. He suspects it isn't. Notice the prejudice, though. He's already assuming, you know, he, he said, I don't really know what the evidence is, really. He says, but I suspect that can't be true, right? All that stuff you're telling me. So it shows an extreme bias already. But here's the here's the big thing that, that caught me. He said, uh, even if the evidence is that good, and even if it's uh, it shows that Jesus rose from the dead, it still doesn't prove Christianity, he said, uh, you know, we live in a strange world. It's a random chance world. Uh, send it to Ripley's Believe It or Not. You know, there's all kinds of inexplicable things. Uh, there's the Bermuda Triangle. There's Stonehenge. There's the, you know, Pyramid in Giza. There are all these unexplained phenomena. That's just another thing that we have to say is unexplained. But notice this. It's not just atheism. Uh, I also remember reading years ago uh, medieval uh, Jewish philosophers like Mahmanides, and one of the things he said is he's trying to deal with the rapid spread of Christianity, uh, and, and it's a kind of spread that goes well beyond what you see in the case of Islam, right? Here is Christianity growing by leaps and bounds against all odds, against uh, suppression. Uh, Christians, uh, in fact, Anthony Flew really marveled over this. He says, for the first four centuries of Christianity's remarkable expansion, he says it was uh, solely through the means of peaceful gospel persuasion. He says, by contrast with Islam, which spread by means of the sword, right? So he's saying Christianity spread incredibly fast and rapidly throughout the world through peaceful means in the face of severe persecution. Now, I'm not saying this is an argument I, I necessarily would use or, or that I wouldn't. I'm just saying that in the face of this, Jews like Maimonides wanted to, to account for it. And he said that he believes that God providentially was allowing the lie of Christianity into the world because he wanted to spread the message of moral monotheism and the messianic idea to the Gentiles in order to prepare the world for when the true Messiah comes. So it's, it's just God kind of getting people used to the idea. So that, that was how Mahmanides reasoned. Well, this, this was picked up by people like Pincus Lapid, a, a Jewish rabbi, who said, as he looked at the evidence, and he's more acquainted than Mahmanides was with the evidence, he looks at the evidence and says, yes, Jesus rose from the dead. And then he just ties it in with what Mahmanides said. And he said, well, God must have done this in order to uh, spread Jewish monotheism to the world. 
right? And 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 they're not alone. I mean, there are other. I, I run across this all the time. There are either people who say uh, there's evidence for it, but it's not evidence f uh, for the conclusion of Christianity. It's just evidence that we live in a chance universe, or it's evidence that God is uh, trying to accomplish uh, some other uh, thing that falls short of you know really pr pointing to the truth of Christianity. So. That's why I say you, you got to take that sort of thing into account when you're dealing with people. People are not as neutral as they like to pretend. That doesn't mean you don't use the evidence. You should be presenting the evidence. You should be clobbering with them with the evidence. You should be embarrassing them with the evidence. But you still have to realize, you know, because I know a lot of people that just get frustrated, right? Like, why isn't this person believing? You know, why aren't they persuaded? And I'm thinking, you know, I'm surprised when they are persuaded. But not because I don't think the evidence is good, but just because I don't think people are, are honest with themselves like they should be. Mm -hmm. Um, I still smile every time I see this, uh, every time I see this mm. name, uh, Apu, Apu Bakar oh. Alpuff Daddy. Dr. Wood, Dr. Wood, what is your view on Immanuel Kant? Uh, Immanuel Kant is, actually, interestingly, I like the pre-critical Kant more than Kant in all his, uh, all his glory, because, uh, before what, what's called the critical turn, uh, which he was—he was on the old side for to be coming up with uh, with completely new views. Um, he actually he actually had very interesting arguments for the existence of God. He he had an uh, it's called the possibility proof, but he argued if anything's possible, then God then God exists. And uh, so I actually did a I did a paper on that one year for uh, in one of my philosophy classes on on Kant. But um, Kant's massively wrong, but absolutely brilliant right you can be wrong and have it have it uh you know you're sitting there you can have it wrong to where it's obviously wrong and stupid and you can point to what's wrong with it uh Kant's one of these guys who makes a system that is so obviously wrong but so insanely brilliant in what he came up with that you look at it and it's got it's got to be wrong but what in the world is what in the world is wrong here uh so yeah wrong but very very brilliantly argue and he's one of the he's one of the few he's one of the few people i can think of uh it, it would kind of be him and it would be wittgenstein hmm. where had a massive impact on philosophy twice Is no what you're thinking oh no uh I, i'm thinking more along the lines of if they didn't come along no one else would have come up with that oh okay. right like other people you know other philosophers descartes hume uh planiga any any of these guys you can look and see developments in philosophy to where if this guy didn't, you know, step in there, someone else would have. It's like um, uh, Isaac Newton, Isaac Newton and Leibniz, Gottfried Leibniz, both came up with uh, calculus around the same time. Well, even if those guys never existed, someone else would have come up with calculus, right? Mathematics had just developed to that point where, hey, we have some issues here. And in order to make a move forward, you, you need calculus and someone's going to figure out, figure out calculus. And so lots of developments in philosophy are like that. You can look, this person came up with this position, but you can look at what led up to that. In the case of Kant and Wittgenstein, these guys just if, if they didn't put forward their theory, no one else would have put that forward. It would have, it would have never occurred to uh, anyone, I don't think. Anyway, um, hmm. that's, my, that's, that's my view. But I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not a, uh, a Kant scholar, so I wouldn't want to say much beyond that. I would say this about Kant that I, I do think is, is worthwhile. One of the things that Kant was doing was reacting to the fact that epistemology was in shambles mm -hmm. as a result of the disputes between the British empiricists and the continental rationalists. You, know, you look at the, the field of epistemology, the, the empiricists ended up leaving things, uh, reducing things to skepticism, and the rationalists reduced knowledge to subjectivism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they were both trying to get at knowledge and and yet you know so so hume says and you got I mean, not hume kant has that great line where he says uh, uh he was awakened from his dogmatic slumber mm -hmm. right uh so at least at least uh you know he's recognizing mm -hmm. there's some some issues here and somebody needs to deal with this because yeah. these guys have just destroyed the field in a sense yeah and by the way i'll just comment that what what it, the, what i was just saying i'm talking about uh kant's metaphysics and his mm -hmm. epistemology uh his moral philosophy is actually in a different category his moral philosophy is is uh 
is is still one of the main still one of the main um one of the main moral theories uh it's still you you have you know five six dominant moral theories where you know virtue ethics and things like that but but deontology is is uh is right up there um here you go anthony is isaiah forty eight sixteen the best verse to prove the trinity from the old testament okay so well I would yes hear... or no mm, yes and no no i'm kidding <laughs> Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, like any biblical doctrine, is something that's found throughout Scripture. So trying to pin it down to one verse and you know that sort of thing, I think, is problematic. Here's what I encourage people to do, and, and uh, this let me. Here's the 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 quick thing that you can do, or the quick answer in a sense, is go watch the video that David has on the channel where I talk about uh, the Trinity in the Old Testament. I have numerous videos on the channel. There's a whole playlist, but there's also one where I did a lecture at a conference on this. And Dave, I don't remember what the title was, but it's on the Trinity in the Old Testament. But what I do in that uh, series, or that those, it's actually two lectures in one. What I do is I point out that there are many things in the Old Testament that we might approach and wonder uh, what they mean and argue, are these Trinitarian or not? But if you know what the first audience would have been thinking when they approach those texts, I think it changes the, the name of the game. And so here's what I mean. If uh, Sometimes people will balk at Christians who say the Trinity is in view in places like Genesis 1.26, when God says, let us make man in our image. Or when God says in 3.22, uh, behold, the man has now become like one of us. Or 11.7, when God says, come, let us go down and there confound their language. That sort of thing is found numerous times in the Old Testament. Christians have always pointed to that as evidence for the doctrine of the Trinity. But now, uh, is that a correct reading? Some people will say that Christians are being anachronistic and reading that back into the Old Testament. Well, the, uh, everybody knows to ask this question when it comes to other passages, but they don't ask it when it comes to, to the passages I just mentioned. I don't know why. Uh, but we all know that you need to ask the question, who is the original audience? And in this case, the original audience of Genesis 1.26 is not Adam and Eve. Right. Adam and Eve, of course, it's taking place at the beginning. Nobody else is there, but not even Adam and Eve are there. What I'm asking is, who was the original audience of these written words? That's the original audience. The original audience is the Exodus generation. Right. The Exodus generation. Moses is writing the Torah, the first five books, inclusive of Genesis, for the Exodus generation. Genesis is laying a foundation for Israel to know where she came from. This is this is how where the world came from. Uh, th these are your your forefathers, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Th these are the promises that God made to them. This is what's being fulfilled now. This God has now come to answer those promises, and uh, so that's the original audience. Now, what was their understanding of God? Now, it's too simplistic for people to say, "Oh, they just thought he was one person." That's not true. If you look at the Exodus account you realize that God is saving Israel by means of the angel of the Lord and his Holy Spirit, right? If you look, just look at Isaiah 63 as an example of this. This is Isaiah the prophet looking back on Israel's redemption from Egypt. And what he's doing is he's saying, you know, Lord, uh, come back and redeem your people. Become to us as you have been in the past. Uh, save us like you did in the past because now we're languishing uh, in, in our sins. And so, but notice how he describes the redemption from Egypt. He says, I will, this is Isaiah 63, verse starting in verse 7. I will tell of the kindnesses of the Lord, the deeds for which he is to be praised, according to all the Lord has done for us. Yes, the many good things he has done for Israel, according to his compassion and many kindnesses. He said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me, and so he became their savior. So notice God is referring to Israel as his children. What do you call somebody in relation to those who are his children? A father, right? So here you already have the notion of God's fatherhood. But notice how it goes on. Verse 8 says, he said, surely they are my people, children who will be true to me, and so he became their savior. In all their distress, he too was distressed, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and mercy, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. So now you have a second figure introduced here. And it's talking about the Exodus. 
right? So you have the father, the one who took Israel to himself as his children, and now you have it saying that he saved them by the angel of his presence. Two things to be said here about that. First, the word angel does not mean a created being. It might refer to a created being, depending on the context, but the word just means messenger. It's used for God in Malachi 3.1. There it says of the Lord, Ha-Edon, it says Vemalach Ha-Barit, which means the messenger of the covenant. It's referring to God as the one who established the covenant with Israel. So, so the term doesn't mean a created being of itself. It's just referring to the function that somebody's carrying out, right? So here it mentions the angel of his presence. That's the second point. This angel, this messenger who saves Israel at the time of the Exodus is identified as somehow the very presence of God. Literally, it means his face, right? The angel of his face. Why is this messenger specified or singled out from others and identified as the very presence of God? You might say this angel is God with us. Sound familiar? In fact, if you look at Judges 13, where Manoah asked the angel for his name, what he says is, my, why do you ask my name? My name is Wonderful. That, that term is used exclusively for God in the Old Testament. God alone is wonderful and performs wonders. But there's one other place that it's used. In Isaiah 7 through 11, it's commonly called the Scroll of Emmanuel. It's a series of prophecies about the coming Messiah. Notice it begins by identifying the virgin-born child as Emmanuel, God with us, the presence of God. And then it, it, it gets into chapter 9, and he's called what? This is the name by which he will be called Wonderful, right? So this name is applied to the coming Messiah. And in fact, the coming Messiah is also identified as God, the mighty God, right? Wonderful counselor, the mighty God in Isaiah 9, 6. Now, one more point here. The text in Isaiah 63 goes on. After uh, verse 9 speaks of the angel of his presence, it then says in verse 10, Yet they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit, so he turned and became their enemy, and he himself fought against them. So here you have it referring to the people that God redeemed from Egypt as people who were redeemed and somehow related to the angel of his presence and the Holy Spirit. They rebelled against his spirit. Why, why is, is it talking about rebellion against the spirit? Right? It, it's assuming the personhood of the spirit and his deity. For To rebel against him means they're opposing divine authority, and so they're becoming the objects of God's chastisement. So this, this is what Israel understood about God. Right? When they're reading the book of Genesis, they're not reading it in a vacuum. They're reading it as the people who were saved by God, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit, just like Christians, when they read the New Testament, are reading it as people who were saved by God, sending forth his Son right, to redeem us from the curse of the law and pouring forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, whereby we cry out, Abba, Father. We don't read the New Testament in a vacuum. They weren't reading the Old Testament in a vacuum. So they didn't read Genesis 126 and scratch their head and say, why is God speaking in the plural? What's this all about? Right? They understood this God is Father, the angel of his presence, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Spirit is explicitly mentioned in Genesis 1. So, that, so you don't even have to go looking elsewhere in, in the Old Testament to find a already a candidate for whom God is talking to, right? So that's the long answer. Is that your answer? <laughs> hey, check out this one by Fencing Mitch. I like this one, Fencing Mitch. Fencing Mitch in the Super Chat says, David, uh, yesterday's discussion, you should name your pagan replacement video, I Can't Believe It's Not Paganism. <laughs> can't believe flavored, it's not flavored with pure monotheism glutamate. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, I'm not going to name my pa uh, pagan replacement video, I Can't Believe It's Not Paganism, but I will do a separate video called that that will actually be a commercial. Right, so I need to, uh, I'll make like a one one to one and a half minute commercial for Islam titled, I Can't Believe It's Not Paganism. Uh, just based on that, I can already, <laughs> I can already imagine that it's going to be a picture of the Kaaba with, you know, all the Muslims circling it. But instead of the, the Kaaba being there, it'll be a tub of, I can't believe it's not paganism. <laughs> and so the whole commercial will be, 
it'll be exactly like you know wanting i can't but for those of you who might not be in a place where they have this tub of stuff called i can't believe it's not butter used to be a commercial in the u.s i don't know if it i don't even know if it exists outside the u.s um, but it used to be a commercial i can't believe it's not butter and so uh it's not butter but it was so like butter that it was called i can't believe it's not butter and so yeah that'd be an awesome commercial i can't believe it's not paganism <laughs> so it has all the features of paganism but somehow it's magically not i like that um <clears throat> christ rules says uh hey david i don't know if you will see this but there is this atheist youtuber called logic who made a video on you i think a couple of years ago and i just wanted to see if you know um there are a lot of <laughs> atheist youtubers who make video responses to me i've never watched a video by logic uh i do recall some of his followers a couple years ago sent me met were posting random comments saying logic just destroyed your career and stuff and it kind of reminds me of of <laughs> of how of, of how muslims act uh but basically guys you have uh you have in this world very intelligent atheists who are arguing very carefully they're trying to rustle through the issues and the arguments and so on and then you have and then you have guys that are basically the the atheist equivalent of you know the chest thumping oh, 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 stupid religion stupid right the the dumb ones are the ones that you know they go around posting on every video oh, you're just arguing your sky daddy's better than every other sky daddy right and it's clear these people have never had an original thought in their entire lives anyway um when people post a response to me generally i ignore them I, I tend to just stay on offense and not not be focusing on you know what's happening if i'm going to answer someone's uh, question or objection it's usually you know a question or objection from someone who's actually commenting on my videos uh if i'm going to pay attention to someone else it's it's going to come down to you know if my first impression of your channel is your fans and they all act like four-year-old children um i'm probably not going to be interested in responding to your channel so if you think this i mean if if enough people were to ever think no this guy's really great and he's making good points that you need to deal with david that would be a separate issue um if it's all a bunch of people who sound like little kids i don't see any reason why i'd be uh, terribly interested in, in responding all right prepare to be schooled anthony hmm. anthony how would you respond to the orthodox claim that sola scriptura is the mother of all heresy? Well, I mean that, that's a that's a claim. So uh, claims don't need, you know, anything more than to be denied. I mean, you, you need an argument for it. I, I understand. You're just, you know, obviously you're asking a question here, and you're not even. First to of all, do you agree up. or not? No, obviously I okay. don't. Okay, but. I mean, I mean, you have plenty of uh, heresies originating within the context of the Eastern Church, as well as within the yeah, context I mean, of the that, Western that, that, Church. Yeah, I mean, that's just silly, because even before, you know, people yeah. were proclaiming Sola Scriptura, and, you obviously had her heresies. And, and here's the other thing that, that you need to take into account. Sola Scriptura is a product uh, of uh, the Protestants who broke off of the Western Church, right? The Western and the Eastern Church broke off from each other at the Great Schism, but so so what I'm saying is you can say the Western it, it, this is this would be the Eastern uh, approach to things right to say the Eastern Church is the original, but uh, but you still have to say that Rome is a schism from the Eastern Church in their mind, which means that Rome, which is not a sola scriptura, uh, you know, religion. I mean, a, a view of their approach to Christianity is not sola scriptura, right? They believe in the teaching magisterium of the Roman Church and as papal infallibility and all that kind of stuff so they don't believe in sola scriptura but they're a product of, of of the eastern church and then protestantism would be a further product so they're all in a sense from an eastern perspective everything comes out of the eastern church so i don't know how how it would even be true from an eastern perspective besides that you know who do you think the you know heretics are uh, certainly i mean i'm not attacking the eastern church just remember you're asking this question <laughs> Uh, but but the the early battles that are being fought are uh, in many cases being fought in the context of the Eastern Church, right? The the battle over Arianism and that sort of thing. So I mean I just don't think that makes a lot of sense. You might want to say that sola scriptura is is problematic and and uh, is conducive to this sort of thing, but you certainly can't make it exclusively responsible for that sort of thing or 
somehow in a unique way or anything. Here you go, Anthony. It's about to get real here. Alex Wood says, a question I would like to ask, what are your views on Calvinism? More specifically, predestination, Anthony. You reformed Calvinist type who believes that real Christianity uh, uh, why, didn't come along until John Calvin? Why pretend that he's asking me and not you? In fact, he's got your name. Why don't you own up to his, uh, his question? You, you know, I don't really have a view. <laughs> <laughs> So I am I am reformed, unashamedly reformed. I believe that God is sovereign over all things, and that includes man's salvation. And I think Scripture clearly teaches that. But I also recognize that not all Christians hold that view. Uh, I, I would say that certain things are are beyond the realm of being authentically Christian. I would say, you know, for example, I would altogether reject Pelagianism, which is the notion that man can save himself. That's been rejected by the church throughout its history. What hasn't been uh, unanimous throughout the church is, uh, you know, exactly what the relationship is between uh, grace and and man's will and, and other aspects of man's involvement. So, so there it gets a little bit more debatable. Uh, there are some versions that I would say are simply pagan and not Christian at all, even if they go under the name of Christianity. So I am reformed. I believe that's the uh, clear scriptural teaching, but you know I don't think that means only reformed people are saved or something like that. Um, yeah, I'm you, sitting with David, who can't yeah, make do. up his mind because he's uh, yeah, because you're trying to convert me. <laughs> I wouldn't have even put that question up there. That's uh, that's all you. No. Here, here you go. Uh, this shows you how how far behind I am on these questions. Uh, <laughs> This was from way back when we were wow. saying where we're from. You said you're from California. I said, um, uh, someone mentioned North Carolina. I said I was born in North Carolina. But Hayden said, I thought David was raised in West Virginia Trailer Park. Uh, was he born in North Carolina? Yes, I was born in North Carolina. Uh, we they were left. kicked out of North Carolina. Ca- actually, actually, kind of. Actually, <laughs> kind of. I was two years old. That's when my dad uh, went up for trial for... Um, for bringing drugs back from Mexico. He told me, he told me I was in my teens. He was talking about it. And he goes, yeah. And so I got, uh, I got found guilty of, of having, uh, eight pounds. Uh, I said, he said six pounds of marijuana. Anyway, like, like two years ago, I, I asked my mom about that. I said, uh, I said, yeah, dad said he got caught with six pounds. She goes, six, more like 60. <laughs> um, so anyway, he, was uh so he went to trial there my grandfather my grandfather who was a he was a green beret but he knew the judge and he basically got my dad not sent to jail but the judge said get out of this state and uh so they moved to massachusetts when i was two that's when they they got divorced there and uh, I was seven when we left Massachusetts. By this time, my dad was my dad was gone. Uh, so I don't I don't ever remember living with my dad when I was young, um, except for like visiting. Um, but uh, I remember one time he kidnapped me and left me with some nuns. And I actually I was like three years old, but I have images of like being in this underground place with these <laughs> nuns on on these little trampoline on these little trampoline bed that they would put me to sleep on. But uh, yeah, so hey, I, was I, sev- I was seven when I moved to West Virginia. So I grew up in West Virginia, West Virginia Trailer Park from the age of seven. So now everyone has the timeline in mind on the life of D. Wood. Did I ever tell you how my family ended up in California? Well, you're, you're Italian. I'm sure you yeah, so my, bring in the mafia there or something. No, no. So Well, <laughs> it, it, it doesn't involve this in a sense, but the... Uh, so. Uh, my great grandparents moved from Sicily to Ohio, Cleveland, Ohio. My uh, whoa, isn't that where vocabs? Yeah, was from? yeah. yeah. Okay. So vocab, you know. What's with Italians and uh, and uh, back east? They moved back east. Uh, haven't you ever heard uh, uh, where the name Tony came from? Uh, you know, they didn't know what to call all these people coming over on these boats, so they just looked at the papers, right? Uh, where they they stamped T O N Y on the papers to new york no oh. and so they're looking at the papers okay tony tony so that's where the name that's came. supposed to be a joke right? yeah it's supposed yeah. to be a joke that's why you're laughing the, even though you don't want to no there was uh, there was uh, a <laughs> little, little side, i didn't tell it really, really little, well. little side story me and nabil were uh 
me and uh, Nabil were on a school trip and we all stopped at an Italian restaurant. We ate Italian. It was like good Italian food. And there were all these Italians in there and we were walking out and we got to the, we got to the parking lot and there was, uh, there was like this Italian like wedding party there or something, but it was like this big crowd of Italians came out and they're all standing there. And I go, Hey Nabil, watch this. Hey, Tony! <laughs> like all these dudes turned around. Ah! <laughs> it was awesome. So, uh, my grandfather was named after Salvatore Talaco. Typically, uh, a Sal is known as Sam, so he always went by Sam. But so Sam Talaco was uh, my great great uncle or something like that. But he was the original. Uh, bodyguard or lieutenant of Lou Perello, who was the first head of the Cleveland Mafia. Hmm. So my grandfather was named after him, but they were both gunned down in a little Italy in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, by a rival, a rival gang faction. And uh, so eventually that sort of stuff eventually pressured my, my grandfather. The rest of our family stayed back east, but uh, the family made him go west for various reasons. So mm-hmm. that's how we ended up out there. But my grandfather... I was never officially a mob member, so I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that in in the history there, there were these uh, murky, murky uh, events and wow. things. Wow! And you ended up as a loser car thief. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm here with you. So this... we got comments on that, by the way. A lot of people <laughs> said they like you now more now that they know you're a car thief. But... <laughs> so, uh, so I don't know if you guys know this, but it, you, if it, you it, haven't seen David's uh, testimony video. Excellent, awesome video. But I, I thought of doing something like that. But my my thing was going to be so you know that David he's going down into the subways as he's telling his story and things are getting darker. Right, he's getting further into the subway. And then as your your conversion is coming about, you're also coming up out of the subway. Right. So uh, I thought w- what I would do if I do a, a, a testimony video is I. I get a bunch of people from my church to agree to loan me their car, and I would I would put them in different places across town, and then what I would do is I'd tell my story as I'm moving from one car to another, acting like I'm hot wiring it or something like that, right? So, just like you did all in one. Or just hot wire some cars and make it cool. You. <laughs> and do um, it like Terminator style too, where you're like just busting windows and jumping <laughs> there and and doing it. Uh, nah. You get, look, one th- one lesson I've learned, you got to do whatever it takes to make an awesome video. I'll be like, oh, I can't can't get a bunch of windows replaced. Or just go steal a bunch of cars. That's what, I'm, that's what I thought go you to, were saying. Look, look, look. Steal a bunch of cars. I'll be recording it all. We'll, we'll have some, some cameras rigged up on you. I'll record all. You steal a bunch of cars. And then, like, the end is, like, cops showing up, <laughs> beating the crap out of you, tossing you in the car. And, and you say, I got it all on film. Yeah. And, and then, but, but you'll be like, and this is to remind everyone... That your sins will catch up with you, and there is a future judgment. All right, and then and then you go into the car, and then you get locked up, and then you start a prison ministry. And then and then See, this says, is how I come up with. I, I told yeah, everyone I am an unstoppable gr- fire hose of good gr- ideas. Brilliant idea. All right, uh, I'm going to check some of the super chats here since uh, I am way behind on the comments here. Shabazz Aziz says I used to be Muslim, but Christ saved me in my dream, and I use many of your videos to help open my family members' eyes to the evils of Islam. Thank you, brother David. Well, that's cool. That's what. That's why we make videos, um, so that everyone else has them, and then they have the information. Uh, way more coming. Um, As says, both of you were jailed, now serving the Lord, breaking chains Muslims have in their mind. <laughs> Paul and Silas of this generation, David Wood and Anthony Rogers. You know what's funny? Because people used to say that, like me and the Beal, when we get arrested in Dearborn, they'd say, you're like the modern Paul and Silas and stuff like that. And I'd be thinking, what are you talking about? We're morons and losers, <laughs> right? But then I would start thinking, wait a minute, were the apostles just like, you know, kind of jerks and <laughs> stuff like that? But we Behind rem- the scenes. We rem- yeah, behind the scenes, but we remember them as these awesome guys. Because I'm thinking, wait, you guys think we're like these awesome guys? <laughs> we're like the biggest <laughs> bunch of jerks I've ever met in my life. <laughs> so anyway. Yeah, you know, you know, Paul and Peter were... Uh... You know, making fun of each other behind the scenes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, there was probably some major uh, <laughs> trash talking going on. Well, I mean, we do know that they, they were real people, right? And they had real uh, issues. You have uh, evidence of, of falling out and things like that and then reconciliation, right? Mm-hmm. Paul and Barnabas and, and Mark and, and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, they're You know, they're not paper saints. You know, the, the scriptures don't pretend that they were sinless or anything like that. 
Uh, and, and some of that doesn't even necessarily have to involve sin. It's just difference of, of viewpoint on, on certain things, like how we're going to do this. And, and somebody gets really stuck in their in their mindset. Like, no, it is it because I've, I've noticed like uh, a lot of the people that deal with, with jihad and really go after jihadis and stuff, they don't work well together. Hmm. Um, they don't work well together because it's kind, it's kind of a certain personality type where if you are the sort of person who goes out and people are sending you death threats and stuff like that. You're just, you're, you're kind of the person who doesn't, who doesn't like to take crap from people. Mm -hmm. And so that's great as far as dealing with jihad. But if you're, if people are trying to get you to work well with other people and you both have these personalities where you're ready to go to war over, over your disagreements, people tend to not work well together. And it's, it's probably, it's probably a, a similar situation with, you know, some of the early, you know, some of the early, yeah, the leaders. And, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's probably look. First of all, these are the kinds of guys who are, you know, they're signing up for the Messiah because they think he's ready to come and just crush everyone, stuff like that. So they're signing on with the with Jesus because they believe he's the guy. But then, I mean, if these are the guys who really stick with it, and then you've got this other guy, Apostle Paul, and other guys coming along. Wait a minute, he's thinking he can he can school us. What are you talking about? I was. Yeah, so I can imagine. I can imagine having yeah. some uh, plus, having some issues. Plus, these guys aren't chumps. Uh, Paul himself was brilliant. Mm -hmm. I I, re I read liberal scholars talking about Paul, and even though they're they're not coming down where I come down, they recognize his brilliance. Ant Ant Anthony yeah. Flew, Anthony Flew, who's one one of the one of the champion atheists of the twentieth mm. century. So it was Anthony Flew, and really, really a, a couple others. So you had Mackey, you had Bertrand Russell, A.J. Ayer. Those those the those the those the big ones. Um, but Anthony flew one of the, anytime, every philosophy of religion course I ever had includes Anthony flew's, uh, some of Anthony flew's writings, but Anthony flew after he came to kind of believe in, in God, uh, he was asked, he was asked, do you think you'll ever actually convert to a religion? He said, no. Uh, but he was asked, could you compare Christianity and Islam? Because he's, he spent, he spent his life studying both. And he drew three comparisons. He said it was, and it's hilarious. He said the, the Bible is an amazing work of literature, um, regardless of your regardless of your your background. Even for an atheist, you 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 could you could read you could read the Bible and find an amazing work of literature. He said to read the Quran is to do penance. Right? For those of you who don't know, what penance is that's where you punish yourself for your sins. He said to read the Quran is punishing yourself for your sins. That is the most perfect description of the Quran. Uh, I've ever seen. Then he drew a comparison between Jesus and Muhammad. He said, "He said Jesus is is an amazingly charismatic figure, and he, everyone has to love Jesus, and so on. Everyone wants Jesus to be on their side." And he goes, "Muhammad most emphatically was not." But he also drew a comparison between uh, Muhammad and Paul. He said Paul was a brilliant scholar. He had a first-rate philosophical mind. That's the phrase I remember. The Apostle Paul mm -hmm. had a first-rate philosophical mind. And it was basically Muhammad was an illiterate caravan robber. And so it was, <laughs> every, it's like every way I can compare Christianity and Islam, um, Christianity wins wins by a, a landslide. And again, this is this is not a this is not coming from a from a Christian. Yeah, and that and that went all the way back to Paul's time, right? I mean I was I just pulled up Acts 26. Uh, where Festus said to Paul, because Paul is, you know, pressing the claims of Christ upon him, mm -hmm. he's giving an apologetic. One of the things he does, by the way, and this this points to this your great learning is driving you mad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I was gonna, you know, before that, uh, you know, Paul says to him, you know, you Festus, you're not ignorant of these things. They didn't happen in a corner. Yeah. So so Paul is uh, one of the things I learned a long time ago. I had a friend who told me. Uh, this that I always keep in mind. He says, you can have a, uh, a good lawyer with a good case, a bad lawyer with a bad case, a good lawyer with a bad case, and a bad lawyer with a good case. Mm -hmm. He was just basically trying to give me the breakdown. You know, so you could have somebody who's brilliant, who makes a great case for a bad position, and, and so forth. So, But what you have in the case of Paul is a great lawyer with a great case, mm -hmm. right? He's got everything he needs, and he's able to prosecute it mm -hmm. uh, with all the skill in the world, in the ancient world. And so here he is coming up against the king, and the, and the king is like, you know, he's, he's acknowledging Paul's brilliance. You know, your, your great learning has driven you mad, Paul, because Paul is actually mm -hmm. arguing for something absurd, right? The resurrection. Uh, but... Uh, the king can't do anything more than than just tell him, you know, you're you're insane. What a what what a what a compliment! And you you can you can imagine, you can imagine what it would have been like for for this guy because there are people I would think of like that, right? Like there are people who, 
you know, they spend their lives studying quantum mechanics or something like that. And they sound a little, they sound a little kooky, right? These, <laughs> these, these like weird physicists and stuff like that. And so it sounded a little kooky with some of their ideas that come up. We'd be like, dude, you're, 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 you're so smart. You sound crazy. But that was like the criticism of Paul. Your, your great learning is driving you insane. Um, so anyway, kind of a cool, kind of a cool sort of backhanded compliment, actually. Um, Bob Tan. Uh, Bob Tom says, David, been seeing you a bunch. I can say, I still say Shroud of Turin, no normal man can be radiated on cloth. Yes, Bob Tom. And I still say, <laughs> I still say, yes, I recorded an interview with Gary Habermas on that. So that will eventually be edited and posted. Michael M said, oh my gosh, David, you got to make that commercial. I immediately stopped what I was doing to say this. God bless. Yeah, it's fun because I actually like making the commercials. And so I made one for, gosh, probably two years ago, but it was called, I think it was called uh, Aisha, the Sharia compliant version of Alexa. And so the idea was you've got your Amazon Alexa, which, you know, you can play music on and things like that. But uh, in the commercial, in the commercial, the commercial was an advertisement for a Sharia compliant version named Aisha, where... It, it it only gives Sharia compliant answers. Actually, you were in that video. Which one? Oh, the you were, Aisha. You were, yeah, you were just the... his friend. You didn't do oh, anything. Yeah. You didn't no, do anything. Didn't you do... were just in the. You were just sitting there. Yeah, I was like uh, teller to pen. <laughs> and it was funny because vocab was just. I don't want to be in this one by myself. <laughs> and so we're like, okay. Well, so a lot of people don't know, and we, you know, uh, I think in that video, that, you know, she's not actually talking. Right. Uh, yeah. The, yeah. There's nothing going on. So that, was, so that was that was that was dubbed by that was my wife. Later, I gave her the line. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm over there. I don't know what you're even going to fill in. I'm just kind of bobbing my head or whatever. And I, you know, as I look at it now, I'm thinking I didn't have a clue what was. <laughs> but it's funny. Yeah. So so later we had to add all the voices, but it was my it was my wife, and I I used like the robot effect on it, and I used uh, an effect to make it uh, to make it sound like a child. Um, Isaac Cruz said, David, how do you create so much content? It seems like you have a couple of videos per day. How do you find so much content to make videos on? Any on any advice on starting an apologetics channel? So that's a couple of issues there. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, basically Isaac, it's for the past year, I've been traveling a lot and travel, travel always it throws off my schedule. If I get into the habit of doing something every day, then I just start doing it automatically. And going to the airport and heading someone else, it always throws off my schedule to when, even when I get back, I don't just automatically jump up and start working on something. Whereas kind of thanks to coronavirus, travel plans canceled. And so, I mean, you see me as soon as I wake up, I start working on a video, right? Work on a video, work on a video, work on a video, work on a video until I record the video, then post the video and so on. And some, yeah, some days I'm getting out too, just because, you know, I finished my, I finished my first video and it's two or three o'clock and I'm like, well, I've got plenty of time to make another one. So I just start working on another one. But yeah, I'm, I'm kind of to the point right now. And I'm kind of the point where as soon as I wake up, I start working on a video, do whatever I do in the evening. Sometimes we'll go live or something like that. But even after that, I'll be working on working on a video for the next day. And so uh, just so you know, the ne tomorrow's video, I believe the plan is. I think it's going to be called uh, Muhammad's Only Fulfilled Prophecy, which it's kind of funny. Muhammad actually prophesied that tons of Muslims were eventually going to leave Islam. Right. And that's what we're seeing right now. So you'd think, you'd think Muslims would be running around saying, hey, don't panic about all these Muslims who are leaving Islam. Our prophet predicted it. He prophesied that all these Muslims are going to be leaving Islam and that we're going to have this avalanche of apostasy. He predicted it. It is in the Muslim sources that all, all these people are going to leave Islam. Why don't you see Muslims running around using this prophecy to, to, to vindicate Muhammad? Well, he said, when you see them, kill them. <laughs> he said, so when you see them leaving Islam, kill them. So... Here you are, you have the best, the best, most clearly fulfilled prophecy Muslims have ever had. Muhammad said a bunch of people are going to leave Islam. And we look around, we see a bunch of people leaving Islam. And they can't even use it to point to Muhammad because he said kill them. <laughs> and so they're in this little problem. But I, I find it hilarious that that's the best case you could. Because Muhammad said all this stuff that can't possibly 
that can't possibly be fulfilled. It can never be fulfilled, right? So for instance, he said, uh, the end will not come until the, pe the people of Dual Colossa run around their version of the Kaaba with their buttocks exposed and blah, 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 blah. That can't happen because it was destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. Muslims destroyed the place. That prophecy cannot be fulfilled. Unless, you, unless you're going to say that eventually Dual Colossa will be rebuilt as this pagan shrine and then the pagan system will arise again. And this, You'd have to believe that if you want to believe it's going to be uh, fulfilled. He said something like uh, that a mountain of gold is going to be discovered beneath the, the Euphrates River and stuff like that. I mean, if Muslims took this seriously, they'd be out there looking for this mountain of gold. Um, he said things like uh, wealth is, you know, people are going to be so rich in the future that you know you, you no one needs anything and you you, you gold is just garbage because it, it, everyone's so rich doesn't seem to be that the world doesn't seem to be heading in that in that direction so he said all these things that are obviously false but the the best case you can make for a prophecy of muhammad is he said before the end a bunch of people are going to leave islam and again it's just funny muslims can't use it because he says kill them execute them chop their heads off so anyway that's that that'll probably be tomorrow's video hmm um, oh wait, he had more. Uh, it seems you're doing a couple videos a day. How do you find so much content to make videos on? Um, I mean, if you think about it, Islam is the gift that keeps on giving. It keeps on, it keeps on giving. But yeah, there's, it's basically a situation. Islam spent years propping itself up on a, a foundation of nothing but lies. We're the first generation that has open access to their sources, meaning that you know Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, those were translated in like the 80s. Um, other sources have been trans are still being translated now. So the sources that you would use to refute the lies, we're kind of the first generation to have those sources. And so it's, 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 it's open season on Islam and going after the lies that they've been telling and any topic you want to go to, if you want to go to so-called prophecies about Muhammad and the Bible, well, there's a bunch of them. You can make a bunch of videos out of that. If you want to talk about, you know, Muhammad's character, well, you got tons of multi-volume collections about all the sick stuff he did. So there's like, there's like an endless supply of sick stuff that this dude did. Uh, so anywhere you want to go, there's just tons of, tons of videos to be made. And so I kind of just jump on whatever, whatever piques my interest for, for a certain day. Uh, and you said, any advice on starting an apologetics channel? Um, yeah uh decide ahead of time that you're gonna stick with it even when stuff sucks and what i mean by that is there will be a time it's called among people who've been on youtube for a while it's called your pain period everyone goes through it because you spend all this time making this awesome video and you put out the video and no one watches it no one watches it because no one knows you're there right so the idea is at first you kind of have to fight for every subscriber every viewer uh, you have to share them on, you know, share them with everyone, share your video with your, your family, your friends, get them to watch it, but going to be very hard at the beginning and you're not going to be very good at making videos. And you can go to any popular channel, go back to when they were making videos at the beginning, their videos usually suck. The difference is they kept at it. You kept at it, they kept at it, 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 got better and better and better and better and better and slowly built up a following. And, uh, yeah, so it, it takes, it takes, it seems like it takes forever to get like your first thousand subscribers, but then your next thousand subscribers is easy by comparison. Uh, because now you've got a thousand people, you know, watching your videos, whereas before, you know, you started with none. Uh, so I would say that apart from things like that, I would say, start watching some of the channels of people who focus on building YouTube channels, right? So there are channels like video influencers and things like that, where, They'll take you through. They'll take you through all the basics. Um, and by the way, me and me and John McRae are planning. We we can't do anything right now because of the coronavirus. But me and John McRae are actually planning on doing something like that, geared towards uh, Christians and and Christians who want to do Christian apologetics online. But we're going to be doing starting from the ground up, uh, showing people how to do that. We'll eventually do that. In the meantime, learn everything you can. No need to reinvent the wheel. All the stuff that other people had to learn through pain. Uh, try to learn that ahead of time. And other than that, just keep putting out the content. Aim for, if, at first, try to aim for one, like one video a week, make it good. Even Keep in mind, even if people aren't watching it then, even if you have no subscribers then, people will watch it later, right? So at first, if you have no subscribers, you make a video, no one watches it, don't think, oh darn, guess what? It's on YouTube, it's still there. So that later, by the time you make your fourth or fifth video, 
and you get some people watching it, well, guess what? If people like your stuff, they're going to go back and watch your first video. And so if you keep cranking it out, I mean, and then if you're, you know, you're making your 30th or 40th video, keep in mind, people are going to go back and watch those other videos. So anyway, those are some basic points. Uh, but <laughs> Jerry Mills asking for a William Lane Craig impression. And then he asks uh, about a, an impression of uh, each of us. Uh, need William Lane Craig impersonation with or without cow puns, dealer's choice. Also, what are top impressions for each of you? I guess, no, I think he means, yeah, what would, like, what is the top impression you could do? Does anyone do impression? Oh, does anyone do an impression of you? I don't know. In order to, I mean, it seems like to do a clear Im Im impression of someone, that the person has to be a little quirky, right? Otherwise, you just sound like a regular dude. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so... If anyone doesn't know what he's referring to here, a couple of years ago, that movie, The Case for Christ, came out, and they had, and I went and watched it, and they had William Lane Craig and Gary Habermas, and these guys all have, like, very distinctive speaking styles, and the, the actors who were playing these guys didn't sound like them at all, which is fine. It's a movie, and, and it's not really essential and stuff like that, but, you know, Gary Habermas, he has this... Uh, I kind of made fun of him, but I said he sounds like an apologetics rain man or something like that. He's always got to got to look at the data. Definitely the data. Got to have 12 facts, you know, because that, that's 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 how he talks. And then Craig, my Craig impression, actually, and this is why he talks about cow puns. The Craig impression, me and Nabil planned on doing this back when there was a show called Faith Under Fire. Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel, Lee Strobel had a show called Faith Under Fire. And after Nabil became a Christian, I said, hey, we should do a fake edition of Faith Under Fire. And have it William Lane Craig versus the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. Because Nabil does this awesome like Indian Indian, uh, Indian accent. So he's going to be the Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And we're going to have uh, William Lane Craig debate him on Faith Under Fire. Now, the problem was Faith Under Fire was canceled. So it kind of became irrelevant. And then we never got around to, uh, never got around to, to doing it. But uh, yeah, so in that, what the cow puns he's referring to here. So he's obviously heard me talk about this before. In the little video I posted, I posted William Lane Craig responding to the holy cow argument. Well, Lee, this is what scholars refer to as the holy cow hypothesis, according to which, you know, and so I just went like that. But uh, in the original, I had a much longer recording and I was like, this can't be a movie review. It's too long. So I cut out a bunch of parts. But one of the things that I cut out was William Lane Craig giving all these cow puns because the the the... The Maharishi Mahesh Yogi argued he has no problem with Jesus rising from the dead as long as Jesus came back as a cow. And so Craig starts making fun of this, but then he gets in all these cow puns and he was going, and all I can say is, where's the beef? I'm not moved at all. This is utterly improbable. And he goes on and on and on. He goes, and so I cannot believe this. There's too much at stake. And, uh, I don't know why, because a lot of people think that that's funny, but I was like, this is too stupid. <laughs> I, I got it out of the video. I should have saved that footage. It would have been uh, would have been funny for, uh, for I think outtakes. It was, I think it was a good Habermas impression, but <clears throat> I think your Craig impression sounded more like Shaggy from Scooby-Doo. That's how Craig talks, man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't do and it. And he goes, so. number one. <laughs> goes, <laughs> Craig, Craig's awesome. So it's Habermas. Um... Let's see. Marilyn Murphy. D. Wood's mind is a scary place, but fascinating. <laughs> I don't know what that's referring to, what we were talking about when that came up. But uh, yes, my mind is a scary, is a very scary place. Adarsh Abraham said, uh, everyone needs to watch David's testimony video. Praise God. Yeah, that was, uh, that was actually, to give you guys, uh, for those who haven't seen it, we actually got it one take first try, right? When we actually mm -hmm. went down there to record, we hit record, we went through it. It was so distracting when we were recording. Not not most of it, but the part where we go down in that long tunnel, you don't see this on the video, but a crowd formed as we're walking along. And I'm saying all this crazy stuff. We're walking along. People see a camera, the cameraman, which was, was just my friend. Um, well, he's a professional cameraman, but um, he's following me and I'm sitting there talking and they I, we walk by people and they hear this crazy stuff and they start following us, right? And so we're down in the tunnel and there's actually a crowd behind the camera. And I'm talking, and I know a lot of these people didn't hear what I said. They're not going to be around for stuff later on. But it was insanely distracting that there's this crowd of people in front of me sitting there going, huh? Right? And so I was getting annoyed. I wanted to, like, just scream at them and say, mind your own business. Get out of my face. 
and then go start over. But I just, I, I kind of kept at it. And then by the time we got on the subway, they had, uh, they had, they had dispersed. But it was so distracting that I did not know if I was speaking coherently at all. We got to the end. Um, I, we sat down. We finished recording. I'm sure I probably have this somewhere. I probably saved this footage. But we, they, they, the camera guy says cut, and I go, "What'd y'all think?" And uh, and they go, "Oh, we thought it was awesome." And I go, "I think it sucked. I felt like it sucked. Huh. I felt like it was. I was so, I was so enraged by by this and thinking." I don't know what I said, right? And if I, so it was kind of just, if I just did all of that and then I have to go home and watch it. And then if I find out that I didn't make any sense and I was just, you know, sounding, sounding like a complete idiot because I was so distracted by these people that then I have to go back down there. We have to go record it all again and go through all that again. So I was like enraged. I, I thought it sucked. And uh, they're like, no, it was good. And so anyway, we got home and uh, actually it was 34 minutes long. If I, I it felt like 15 minutes. If I'd known it was 34 minutes long, I would have I would have said, nope, let's go do it again, and we gotta we gotta move faster. Huh. Yeah. And you were also walking through the the, the subway, um, singing. Yeah. Right. So there, I mean, there's just a bunch of things which it's kind of remarkable that you got it all in one take. There, yeah. there were so many opportunities for that to go differently when you think about it. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that worked well. So anyway, yeah, we recorded a whole testimony video on a train. My original plan was. My original plan was I was going to get through there. And once I got out, I was going to, I was originally planning that I was going to be holding a mic the entire time and talking. And that when I got out of the subway, uh, it was going to, it was going to be Nabil there and I was going to hand the mic to him and he's going to start walking. But his is, that's when he was traveling all around the world and it was just never going to, we're never going to line up. So I was like, all right, I just got to go ahead and go mm. ahead and record it. Mm. Um, let's see. Peter Millich says, uh, here's my prediction for the next stupid defense of Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. She was born on a leap year, so when she is said to be nine, she's 36. I'm surprised you know, they don't they don't have leap year on the lunar calendar. I know you're joking, but I'm surprised that they don't make some argument. Or I, I'm surprised that there's no common argument that uh, based on you know them doing this with this unique calendar that it's actually way off and she's much older. Uh, MDS with the super sticker. J.O. says, God bless you. All of us should be uh, apolog apologetics and polemics. Um, yes, we're, keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we are actually all commanded to be apologists in the Bible. doesn't mean you, you have to be a full-time or professional apologist, something like that. But Christians in general, 1 Peter 3.15, are commanded to be apologists in the sense that if someone asks you, hey, why do you believe in this stuff? You're supposed to be able to give an answer. doesn't mean you have to, you know, you, you, you're supposed to be prepared for every objection or every criticism or something like that. But if someone says, why do you actually believe in this? You should be able to give a case. And if you can't, watch some videos and start thinking about, you know, what issues actually make you believe in Jesus or make you believe in God and stuff. And so think about, think about those things so that you can actually present them if someone, if someone questions you. Uh, because keep in mind, I mean, that was, that was a command in early Christianity, but the impact that that sort of thing had when Christians are going out, when Christians are going out and they're preaching, they're preaching in this context of, you know, Greco-Roman paganism and philosophy. But I mean, if you asked your average pagan, Hey, why do you believe this stuff? Well, I don't know. Cause it's, it's just what we believe, right? There's no reason for it. There's no reason, just as what you're raised to believe in, and that's that's what you believe in uh, as your culture. It's not. There's nothing you can prove. You're not going to sit there and oh, I will, I will show you that Jupiter did this or that Zeus did this. There's there's none of that. It's just you know these are the stories we pass down. Um, if you ask the same thing to the Christians, you got a very you got a very different kind of answer, right? I mean, the Christians the Christians were there saying no, actually, uh, Jesus death by crucifixion that was a public event. And we know that he rose from the dead because here are the people he, appe he, he appeared to. And they can testify to what they saw. And so it was a totally different. It was, here's what we're saying. You've got what you're saying, and you have no reason to believe it. We've got what we're saying, and we, haven't, we have evidence for it. And within, within about, I mean, three centuries, by the time you get to the fourth century, uh, Christianity had permeated the Roman Empire and did so without shedding a drop of blood. Anything, anything you wanted to add? No, um, good. Although good, somebody, because no one likes you. Look. Somebody did ask, "Why do you hate Islam so much?" I don't remember who it was, but uh, 
the, the assumption is, of course, so they're, they're, they're assuming that you hate Islam because you refute Islam. And I, I'm sure they're sort of smuggling in there the confusion between Islam as a religion and Muslims as people. Um, yeah, Islam is just... Uh, <laughs> Sam, I don't always agree with atheists, but Sam Harris said, uh, said mm. Islam is the mother load of bad ideas. <laughs> <laughs> That's an awesome... That's an awesome quotation from Sam Harris. But... Uh, Gosh, how much time do you have, right? <laughs> if you're talking about, yeah, it's like about they, it's like they don't watch your videos. It's yeah. not like you have, you've been keeping it a secret. Yeah, right? I, mean, uh, <laughs> I, I clearly don't like this, but I don't. I'm not telling you why. Um, you've got this violent ideology that calls for the the subjugation of the entire world, that forces people to convert, that says you have to be sentenced to death if you leave it, that is horribly oppressive to women, that tells husbands they can beat their wives into submission, that allows you to hire prostitutes to treat women as property that allows you to take sex captives and rape your captives even if they're married that where you treat your own wives like your own uh, basically sexual property right the, sir too that that's what it says that that your wives are a tilth to you a tilth is a, ple a piece of land that you plow it says uh, approach your tilts how you will, will right that which means do do whatever you do whatever you want to them and by the way that the historical context of that is that a woman was refusing to have sex with her Muslim husband in a certain position. She said, I'm only having sex in one position. I don't want to do it in that, in that other position that you want to have sex in. This is brought to Muhammad. And the response from Allah is, uh, she's your tilth, plow her how you want. So she has to, she has to do what you want and do all the, do all the things that uh, you want. She doesn't have any say so in the matter. Uh, women are said to be stupid and immoral. Their testimony is only half as valuable. Um, as a man's, um, you look at the, the commands for Muslims to uh, attack Christians, uh, to attack Jews, to violently subjugate us. Uh, and the reason is because we do not believe in Islam. Uh, Islam calls Jews, Christians, and pagans the worst of creatures. So we're lower than dogs. We're lower than pigs, according to Allah. Uh, the Quran says that Allah has no love for people who reject Muhammad, who don't believe in Muhammad, but simultaneously says that Muslims are the best of peoples. So you've got this ideology which props up one group and makes everyone else horribly inferior and says you can treat them like garbage, you subjugate them, you force them to pay you money, you can take them as, as sexual captives, you can do whatever you want to them. Um, and then, of course, you know, one entire gender is massively, horribly uh, oppressed in Islam. There's nothing, there's nothing good there that is actually didn't you know doesn't exist elsewhere and it takes all of this and combines it with being the stupidest pagan nonsense i've ever seen in my entire life when you look at the stupid stupid claims of muhammad that you have to eat this certain number of dates and then you're you're free from poison you have to dump your fly and uh, you, you know you have to pee in a certain way and and ha over half of the punishment of the grave is because of peeing improperly and you have to pee while squatting and all, all this nonsense that it's all wrapped up and you look and what this does is it just keeps people so busy doing all these stupid things that they never actually sit back and reflect on how stupid it is and it does all of this in the name of god claims to believe in jesus but reduces jesus to someone who propagates the same stupid idiotic pagan nonsense and you're asking, <laughs> David, why do you hate this? <laughs> How do you not hate this? Right? It's like the worst thing ever. I can't believe it's not paganism, but it is. <laughs> All right. Anyway, hope that answered your question. <laughs> uh, Magic Man says, atheists are having a hard time to believe in God because atheists falsely believe that God is like a genie that serves and fulfills human wishes. Um, there, there is an element of, of truth to that, namely that lots of atheists are thinking of God as a kind of like superhero. And why isn't God rushing in and doing this? Why, is, why isn't God rushing in and doing that? As opposed to the one who is upholding and sustaining us in existence every moment that we exist. You know what I mean? Um, so as opposed to God being sort of the foundation and, and basis of all reality, they're thinking of God as like, you know, the superhero. Why isn't God rushing in and saving my grandma from this happening or helping me through this problem? And, you know, he didn't he didn't do this for me. So I'm just going to toss him aside. He's not he's not a good he's not a good genie. 
Yeah, and there are people that uh, you know profess to be Christian who do think that way, right? I mean, you've, you've got those who think God is a cosmic bellhop. They mm-hmm. ring a bell and he's rushing to, to do whatever their current desire is. But that's not what the Bible teaches. However, that is what the Islamic sources teach when it comes to Allah, at least with respect to Muhammad, right? That, that it, Allah basically seems to exist to satisfy Muhammad's desires. So, mm-hmm. but, but Christianity certainly doesn't teach that. The, the God of the Bible is sovereign. You know, he's, not, uh, he's not aloof. He, he, he hears the cries of his people, but at the same time, uh, he's working out his sovereign will in history. And that means that many of the things that are happening aren't going to be clear to us in, in terms of their overall reason why until history reaches its climax. Mm-hmm. Uh, Magic Man said, please make a video about Muhammad's morals. I've made a lot of videos about Muhammad's morals. That Muhammad is supposed to be a prophet, therefore should have a higher standard of morals than regular man, yet his morals is much backwards than the laws of the Kufar. Yeah, guys, just to clarify on all these issues, because Muslims often make this mistake of thinking that prophets are supposed to be these these wonderful characters, right? These these wonderful figures who don't do anything wrong. And biblically, the the prophets are doing some messed up, horrible stuff uh, a lot of the time. So biblically, God takes messed up individuals and uses them, right? The, 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 there is not this there is not this tremendous tremendously uh, exalted picture of prophets to where there's these you know these these virtually sinless people like we find many Muslims thinking. Um, so that's that's one issue. The difference with Muhammad is that Muhammad is supposed is put is is laid out as the pattern of conduct for Muslims. That's my objection, right? So if Muhammad were just a messed up prophet and the Quran were condemning him, in other words, if Muhammad had married a nine year old girl, and then God had come along later and said, "Hey, you married a nine year old girl, you sick messed up individual, stop doing that. Let everyone know they can't do that." And you go out and and preach this message, uh, that would that would be fine, but all the Quran does is is affirm all these sick things that that Muhammad is doing. And here's what here's what I find interesting, Anthony. Muslims will go, and I've seen Adnan Rashid do this. We can't believe in the Bible because you know it says that Lot had sex with his daughters. Mm-hmm. And one they don't they, one they don't recognize Lot's not a prophet in the Bible, right? right He's right. Abraham's nephew. That's it, right? And and there's a point to all that story about good people going and mixing with the worst people in the world and the impact this is having on them and on future generations. Um, there's a there's a message there. Muslims just wipe it all out. No, I can't believe that that sort of sick thing would happen. That that bad thing would happen. <clears throat> but the more they do this, they say they're throwing out all these stories of all these prophets doing these things. And they're only going to believe the prophets did all these wonderful things. Well, the better you make the prophets by selecting what you want to believe about them, the worse Muhammad looks by comparison. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're saying all of these guys, we're going to cleanse the stories of all these guys until these guys only did good things. And here's Muhammad, the sickest freak of all time. Muhammad doesn't look good by comparison. Muhammad now looks like the worst guy in the in the history of the prophet. He already does. but uh, And it shows a clear failure to really understand what's happening in the Bible. Mm-hmm. Uh, just to take so so Muslims will say that Adam was a prophet and Noah was a prophet, for example. But if you look, if you look and you compare Noah and Adam, what's interesting is that Noah in the Bible is presented as a kind of second Adam in mm-hmm. a sense. Yep. Uh, when when God places man in you the you can garden, actually line up the stories, right? And you get all yeah. these you get all these parallels. And, and that's just one of many. But but here's the point. The, the, the point is that so Adam places or God places Adam in a perfect situation in the garden and the condition for life is that he's perfectly obedient, that he would have the right to reach forth and, and uh, take from the tree of life and live forever. But if he, by contrast, disobeys, then he'll be subject to death, kicked out of the garden. All of his descendants will uh, necessarily, uh, you know, reap certain consequences from that. But that means then that you need a uh, somebody else to come along and do what Adam was supposed to do and do it for the human race. And so, and that's what God is basically promising in Genesis 3 when he says, uh, I'll put enmity between you, the serpent, and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He'll crush your head, you'll bruise his heel. So whoever this descendant of the woman is, he's going to come along and destroy Satan, but in the process he's going to be wounded in his own heel. Now, Christians ultimately recognize that's fulfilled in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But before that happens, people are looking forward to it. They're anticipating it. One of the things that means, remember that when God cursed the ground when man sinned, he said that you're uh, you're going to uh, work and toil by the sweat of your brow. No longer are these things going to be easy for you. God made everything perfect. It was all easy for man. Now it's going to be with much, much labor, toil, sweat, hardship, everything else that goes with that. So when, when Noah is born, notice what they're thinking about Noah. They name him Noah. His parents name him Noah, which means rest. They're looking to Noah as potentially the fulfillment of that promise. That's why it says, if you look at uh, Genesis 5, it says they named him Noah saying, he will bring us rest from the work of our hands. So they're expecting this promised rest to come with Noah. And while Noah uh, is portrayed as somebody who believes in God, scripture still doesn't present Noah as sinless. In fact, it says in chapter 6 that while the, the earth was wicked and corrupt in his sight, it says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. To, to even speak of grace presupposes that Noah is not perfect. If he's receiving grace, that means he's receiving unmerited favor. This is not something he deserves. It's contrary to his deserts. So Noah is selected out of that uh, mass of perdition, uh, of corrupt humanity, and God is going to save the world through him, Right. And so, but then what happens is, you know, God delivers him through the, the flood, him and his family. And then you have uh, the ark coming to rest on Mount Ararat, on a mountain. And here's where people miss a lot of stuff. Eden was actually on a mountaintop. If you look at Ezekiel 28, it explicitly refers to Eden as a, uh, a mountain plateau, if you will. Uh, and that's why all throughout scripture, when uh, you have the prophets meeting with God. There are often these mountaintop situations where Moses is going up the mountain. God is telling him to go up the mountain. And it's showing that, uh, you know, the, the, you have to go back into God's presence. And anyways, not to go into all that too much, but the point is that there's, there's uh, Noah comes to rest on Mount Ararat, and then he's in a garden. And what does he do? He ends up getting drunk by partaking of the fruit of the vine, just like Adam. It doesn't say he drank the fruit of the vine. But it does, uh, there's a parallel there, right? Uh, Noah comes off of the ark and he's in a, a new world, just like Adam was. And he sins by partaking of the fruit of the vine. And he had also been given the same command, right? Increase and be multiplied, the same command given to Adam. But the, the point of this is, while they thought that Noah might be the person to deliver them from the curse, he turns out not to be. So he is a, a, a godly figure. He's not a perfect figure, but he, uh, he's, not, uh, he's not perfect, so he can't be that final solution to man's problem. And so he, he becomes a foreshadowing or a type pointing forward to uh, the true second Adam who's going to come and deliver mankind. And that's what's happening over and over again with Old Testament figures, not just Noah, right? It, it's happening with all sorts of figures. It's happening with uh, prophets like David, for example, who's foreshadowing the coming Messiah. So, so it's not like uh, it's not like this is to no purpose. God is using sinful people to illustrate the need for a sinless Savior. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a couple more comments here. Let's see. Lisa, look, says Jesus loves us. Ishka Bibble says, a Muslim told me that Muhammad wasn't white, he was red. I told him he was white with a tan. What's your tick? Um, well, I mean, I often make fun of Muhammad for being the whitest prophet in history. That's in the context of, uh, you know, this idea of, you know, how Islam was presented to African Americans in the 60s and 70s. Like, here's the, here's the guy you should go to if you really want to stick to Whitey, convert to this religion. And they didn't have the sources, but now that we actually opened the sources, Muhammad's followers were, were obsessed with talking about how white he was. So that's the context in which I'm making fun of how, how, how silly it is for Muslims to use this in appealing to people uh, when this guy's, all the, all the Muslims did was emphasize how white he is. With that said, if we're, if we're being, you know, if we're trying to, if we're, if we're not, if we're not joking about this, then, you know, we got to keep in mind, he's not, he's not like white European. Um, he's white among the Arabs, but he, here's the, here's the real issue. Um, 
Well, well, two. So before I even say that, I have to point out that you do have some different descriptions of Muhammad in the sources. We stick with the white because it's just the, the extent to which they hammer this home by saying, you know, the whiteness of his cheeks and the whiteness of his arms and the whiteness of his armpits and the whiteness of his shin and the whiteness of his forearms and the whiteness of his legs and the whiteness of his stomach. I mean, they're constantly harping on how white this is. But that brings us to the real point, namely... They were obsessed with this guy's whiteness, right? Why are they obsessed with color? Well, they're they're thinking uh, in the Muslim sources they think of color as you know dark, bad, you know white, better, and so they're constantly pointing out Muhammad is so white, he's so white, he's he's so pure. You go to the Bible, how many descriptions do you have of Jesus' color? They just don't care. They just don't care. You start you start having talk of you know the color of this vision I you know I saw and stuff like that in, in Revelation. He's, he's just trying to describe the you know what what he's what he's seeing around there. As far as the biographies that we have of Jesus, how many times are they harping on what he looks like? It's not the issue. Focus is what he was doing, right? In Islam, they're so focused on glorifying him that they have to praise him about everything. And because they're obsessed with whiteness as this good feature, they just want to praise every single body part of Muhammad for being like as white as it could possibly be. And so uh, that, that's, kind of, that's kind of the point of that. But, it, you know, if your friend's saying he's red, then say, okay, give, it, give, us, give us the source and show that it outweighs all these sources saying that Muhammad was the whitest guy in Arabia, whitest prophet in history. In fact, guys... I had, I had someone uh, who's actually a, a professional artist draw a picture of Muhammad for me, since this is Draw Muhammad Month. Um, and uh, here he is. All right. I've used that one before <laughs> in a video. Um, Same but, picture? <laughs> I'm just kidding. That'd be funny. I should do that for because uh, uh, I think it's the 20th. Um, everybody draw Muhammad Day or something like that. I should just <laughs> pretend I'm drawing the entire time and then hold it up. <laughs> this is a white piece of paper. Then you're going to have to be able to go into the background. Uh, St. Skanderberg says, we only got a few more here, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, St. Skanderberg says, do you think Joe Exotic from Tiger King is based on the life of Muhammad? I have to confess. I, I mean, I have an idea that it's some dude who lives with tigers or something like that, but that's all I know, so I couldn't I couldn't comment. You know anything about the Tiger I King? I don't, I don't Yeah, know I don't know enough about it. Huh. Uh, Luke, uh, Luke L007 said, do you, an do you anticipate even more embarrassing Islamic sources being translated in the near future? Yeah, we have the main Sunni Islamic sources available, but yeah, there are other sources with really disturbing things. Like for instance, one of the things you don't, one of the stories you don't hear me commenting on is Muhammad sleeping with a, a dead woman, right? That's uh, that that's not it's not a that hasn't been translated. That's from Kansal Umo, and we don't have it in English. So generally, I don't comment on the things that aren't available that aren't available in English. But yeah, I'm sure once more sources are are translated, um, and the idea there is it says he he slept with the woman mm -hmm. in her grave. But uh, the the Arabic for sleep is kind of like our English. You could and say English. I slept with her, and it meant you know I literally just slept. I slept beside her. Um, or it can refer to sex. And so, yeah, before using some of that, I would want to see and would want to do a little investigating. But yeah, I anticipate more embarrassing stuff. Also, there's really cool stuff. There's really cool stuff that's going to be uh, available that's not necessarily just, you know, embarrassing for Muhammad, but damaging as far as the lies that Muslims have built up. So I was talking to a a Christian Quran scholar, and I pointed out something that me and I've mentioned, I, I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but something that Nabil and I wanted to do, and this was like, this was like 2007 or 2008. So you're talking a lot of years ago, but back when we were, we were, we were starting debating, we had a couple of quotations from Ibn Abi Dawood's Kitab al-Masahif, which was, it's this by the, this is by the son of the Hadith scholar Abu Dawood. And so his son actually put together a work that is on differences among various Qurans. And so he recorded, you know, some of the differences among various Qurans and so on. Never been translated. Nabil and I were like, we need to eventually get some money and have someone translate this. 
And so we never actually got around to it, but I was talking to a guy who says he could actually, he said if I could fund it, he would, he could put together a team of, uh, of Arabic translators who will translate the entire work. So notice all of a sudden we would have just absolutely devastating evidence against the, the claim that the Quran's been perfectly preserved. So we already have devastating evidence against that claim, right? You've got people putting together Quran manuscripts side by side, just showing how different they are. We've got uh, quotes in the Muslim sources that talk about um, that talk about you know entire chapters coming up lost and so on. But but this is this is a, this is a Muslim work that is specifically geared towards that. This and by the way, this is the source where you have, uh, for instance, um, Ibn Masud saying that the Quran is only supposed to have 111 chapters, and Ubay ibn Kab saying it's 116 and stuff like that. That's in that's in a Kitab al Masahif. So we're going to get that translated. I will probably find out how much it's going to cost, see what I can cover, and then take, do a fundraiser for the rest, let them go to work. I don't know how long it takes. I don't know if it takes two months or 10 months or whatever, but they'll get that translated. And then we'll have that and we'll just keep going. And uh, all these, all these lies going to come crumbling down. I want to see that avalanche of apostasy. Um, Cheryl R. also in the Super Stickers. Hindu historian says, Thanks for showing me how easy it is to debunk Zucker Nike. It helped me see how ridiculous his claims about Hinduism are too. Yes, uh, keep in mind, this is, it's just a problem with Islam that their methodology has been geared towards find someone who can say something stupid but make it sound good to a bunch of ignorant people. That's been the Islamic method. Find someone who can say something stupid, but make it sound good to a bunch of ignorant people. And that that's, they've ended up with their apologists, right? And it's, it's funny because they're smarter, they're smarter apologists who, who aren't like that. They just don't do as well. The people who rise to the top are the Zucker Nikes who are saying incredibly stupid, moronic stuff, but making it sound really good to ignorant people who don't know any better. But because Islam has been doing this for years, they kind of make it easy for us to come in and just wreak havoc on, on their claims. Uh, all right, one more. Eric Brown says, I found a miracle in the Quran. He managed to screw up so badly that he misrepresented every professing Jew or Christian. He said, Jews say Ezra is the son of God and Mary is God. No one ever said that. Clearly, miracle is demonic. Yeah, and that is a... Uh, it's a problem with the Quran, namely that if the author of the Quran is Muhammad, I understand Muhammad making these mistakes. I understand Muhammad hearing Christians talking about the Trinity, hearing Christians talk about the Father and the Son, and hearing Mary, the mother of Jesus, and thinking, oh, that's what they mean by the Trinity. I understand Muhammad making that mistake. You could forgive Muhammad for making that mistake. But if God is the author of the Quran, I expect God to know better than that and God to be able to actually respond to orthodox Christianity. What do you think? Yeah, and then of course the fact that he goofs when it comes to the Jews. Yeah, Ezra. Uh, I mean, where does where in the world does that come from? I, I mean, I you, you've got at least a, a an idea of where it could have come from, as an error, of course, but where it could have come from in the case of Christians. You just gave it right. He he hears the terminology father son. He also hears Mary referred to as mother. So if Christians believe in a Trinity, then it must be father, mother, and son. That you at least have some accounting for, but where in the world does the notion of even the confusion of Ezra as son of God? I imagine it was it was just another you know bad uh, mistake in reasoning, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but but maybe you know we don't know of any sect that 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 believed that mm -hmm. of, of Judaism, yeah. but but maybe there's. And in fact, when I brought this up to Muslim apologists, I think Shabir Ali said, uh, "Yeah, well, I mean, it could just be referring to one person that we had no record of." <laughs> It's like, really? That's in the Quran? The Quran is responding? In, but, yeah. and, and the problem with that response is, it's not just the Quran. It's in the Hadith as well, where mm -hmm. Jews on the Day of Judgment are going to be asked why they claim that Ezra is the son of God. And so it's, it's, it's attributing this to Judaism in general. And we can't find a record of any Jew who's ever said it. And so yeah. it's very strange. And, yeah. Why, why, why does Allah, in his, in his book, it's only 114 chapters, take time to discuss this belief of a single Jew, and of course it says Jews, right? Jews say, mm -hmm. so he's not talking about one, uh, but why does he have time in his book to talk about this uh, insignificant um, minority of Jews 
but not address Jewry as a whole or in general. So uh, that's just you know problematic. It's it's unwise it's, uh, and so forth. Uh, but the uh, yeah the the Quran doesn't just get Christianity and Judaism wrong there. It gets it wrong all over the place, right? So that, that's yep. just the tip of the iceberg. And so Muslims have to hypothesize all these different groups that were teaching all these different things that we have no records of in order to justify the things Allah is saying when you just have to wonder, why didn't Allah respond to what people actually believed, what Orthodox Christianity and Orthodox Judaism actually believed? Yeah. Um, and and if, if the Quran is not really addressing Christianity, then why do Muslims still insist on interpreting what Christians believe about God in light of the Quran's mm -hmm. false charge. I mean, every single Muslim does this, right? Mm -hmm. The Quran says that uh, the Trinity is belief in three gods, the Father, the Mother, and the Son. I don't know a single Muslim that I've talked to in uh, who objects to the Trinity that doesn't miscast it as belief in three gods. It's like they can't admit that it's not three gods, otherwise they'd be saying Allah was in error. But if they're saying he wasn't really talking about the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity, then then why are they still stuck in that mindset, right? I mean, they, they still insist on interpreting the Christian doctrine in light of Allah's uh, errant claims. So <clears throat> that to me is problematic. Um, Ishka Bibble says, uh, how do we purchase one of your, your coffee mugs? Uh, if, you're, if you're talking about this one, this actually isn't mine. Someone, uh, someone got me this. This was actually a... The team that records Al Fadi's uh, videos, um, hmm. when we go down and do shows together, I showed up and they said they got me a, a One Punch Man, a One Punch Man mug. So yeah, you'll have to look, you probably look up One Punch Man mug and get the uh, get the same mug. Although, uh, although I am thinking about making a mug that, that says something like Jihadi Tears, or hmm. something on it. I saw her too. I think she has a new coffee mug. Right, you know that she has the. Uh, well, she has her giant one, and then she has her. So the giant She names one. them like Khadija and Aisha yeah, and stuff so, like that. Her, her. Uh, so I don't think I had seen the giant one. If you must be, you must have seen it then. You uh, haven't seen her giant coffee. I, no, no, this is the one I just saw. Okay. That uh, that. Um, I'm talking like this. You couldn't miss it. It's the one. That, is it? The She's one got with a the coffee mug that is like this. Is it the one with the picture of Muhammad on? No, I don't think so. Unless so it's that's this what big. I, no, that's what I just saw. It's a big one. It's a big one. She's got she, a picture of Muhammad. Got a picture of Muhammad on it. I would have to have someone draw a picture of Muhammad I could put on. Ooh, and we could call it, it could say Prophet Tears on it. <laughs> You're drinking Prophet Tears. <laughs> oh, wow. I need a picture of Muhammad crying for a mug. Um, and we have Happy Homeschool Texas. My Muslim neighbor is convinced Islam is true. I want to buy him some original sources for him to read. What should I get for him? Uh, we'll first find out if he's actually going to read those sources because, I mean, it's kind of rough to hand him a nine volume set of Sahih al-Bukhari and say, read this. So you might be better off going to him with individual passages, individual hadiths or something like that. Um, but basically if you go to the website, kalamullah.com, that's K-A-L-A-M-U-L-L-A-H.com. You can download PDFs of the same, the same, uh, these are the volumes. So these are. So this is this is this is Sahih al-Bukhari here. Um, this is what volume is this? This is volume seven. So Sahih al-Bukhari in, in the English translation is uh, is nine volumes. Um, but you can you can download the the PDF of the same collection uh, and Sahih Muslim and Sunan Abu Dawud and Jamia Termidi and Sunan An Nasai and Sunan Ibn Majah, all right there. And so what you can do is anytime you're watching a video and you see me putting a hadith up on the screen and you know it's from one of these, you can go to kalamala.com. You can download the volume or just open it up and, and get the, the screenshot and uh, get some individual hadiths for your neighbor to read. And that might be that might be easier than getting an entire collection. With that said, you could always get a whole collection, and you could get this on Amazon or something like that. You could always get in the entire collection of Sahih al-Bukhari and kind of go through and put some post-it notes in there on some passages that, that your Muslim neighbor needs to check out. But uh, yeah, a lot of ways to go about that. But yeah, I don't know about just handing sources unless you really, really know that the that the Muslim, uh, that your Muslim friend would, would read them. All right, should we go ahead and wrap up here? It's 957.
Yeah, sounds good to me. I was just going to suggest that uh, she could also consider giving him uh, Nabil's book. Yeah, that that is yeah. So uh, that might engage them. A yeah, little you, or they might. You know, you know your you know your neighbor. So yeah, um, you got to yeah try and figure out what this person would actually read. If the person would read a book, yeah, I would recommend giving uh, that that neighbor uh, Nabil's book. Asking if you're you know ask your neighbor would you read this, but. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We'd have to know more about your neighbor to give you any advice beyond that. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Well, we've been going two hours and we have work to do. Recordings of my awesome stuff and Anthony's awesome stuff. So we have to actually figure out what we're doing for the rest of the time we're here. I don't know. What, I don't know what our schedule is for tomorrow because we haven't planned that out yet. But uh, we'll let you know. All right. Any final thoughts, Anthony, before I turn this off? Uh... Nope, you erased all the... I've said it all. Yeah, yeah, you've said it all. you said a mouthful. Although, Sheikh Khan, I don't know if you want our Sheikh Kareem. What? Sheikh. Oh, that's just the comment. That's that's just where it scrolled to. Okay, I'll, okay. we're going to respond to Sheikh but yeah, as, I, as Kareem. Because yeah. Anthony wants to... Anthony thinks we need to stop on this, uh, this <laughs> random comment here. So this is from earlier. This is just where I... This is all I'd scroll down I to. I see, I see, yeah. I don't even know what they were referring to, but Sheikh uh, Kareem wants to know how you're going to challenge Muslim uh, scholars. I just wanted to say, how is David going to challenge Muslim scholars about the translation of the Quran when they are fluent in Arabic and he probably uses Google Translate? I don't use Google Translate. I just use a bunch of translations of the Quran from Yusuf Ali and Halali Khan and um, Pickthall and M.H. Shakir and a bunch of other guys. Um, but if, if someone's going to pull a, the stupid stunt, which I'm, I'm assuming you're expecting them to, to pull, oh, well, that's not what the Quran, that's not what the Quran really means. It's saying something different in Arabic. We regard that as like a low-level coward's move, uh, Sheikh Eskarim. That is a total coward's move. And if I'm really responding to that, I do have a video titled why the Quran was revealed in Arabic, and it just massacres everything you're saying. But basically, in, in short, if a Muslim were to use that, oh, well, you can't know what Islam teaches, and I say, how is this religion for all people? I, 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 I'm, I'm on the higher end of educated people, right? I have two master's degrees and a PhD. I'm on the higher end of, of education in the West. If I can't understand your book, what good is it? What good is your book? Your book is useless. You've got a useless book. If even very educated people cannot understand it, your book is useless garbage. That's what I would say. And going, you know, if I were, you know, to spend a little bit more time, I would point out that according to the Quran, the reason the Quran was revealed in Arabic was so that Arabs would have a book in their own language and wouldn't have to go to other people to, wouldn't have to go out and learn another language to read the book of the Jews or the Christians. And so that, that's what's absolutely hilarious about all this. The things that you, the ridiculous objections that you guys raise, if you actually thought about what the Quran actually said, you'd realize the Quran actually self-destructs with this. The position of the Quran is that all these different peoples already had their prophets and they had their own books. And the Arabs were the last people to receive a prophet and a book. Everyone else had their revelation and everyone else was supposed to go to their own prophet and their own book, right? So... The Arabs were the only were the last people to receive a prophet and a book, and so Allah reasoned that if they didn't get a book, they'd be able to stand before God and say, "Well, if we'd had a book like the Jews and Christians, then we would have served God better than they would, and they would actually have a reasonable objection on Judgment Day. No one had brought a book to us, and Muhammad has even commanded this: "I'm sending you to preach to the people in and around Mecca." Right. So this is for Arabs. So notice the reasoning here: you can't expect the Arabs to go to other people in other languages and learn those other languages to understand those books, they need, a, they need a book in their own language. They need a book in their own language so that everyone can understand it. That's what the Quran says about why it was revealed in Arabic. What do Muslims say today? Oh, it's the only book and everyone needs to learn Arabic to understand it. It's You're saying the complete opposite of what your God says. Your God says, the Arabs needed a book in their language so that they didn't have to learn another language, and therefore I gave them the book in Arabic. Now everyone has their book in their own language. It's total nonsense because you don't have these other you you don't have these other books that line up with Islam in other languages. Um, even Muslims admit that now, so they don't realize that they're admitting that Islam is wrong and that Allah didn't know what He's talking about. That Muhammad's a moron. Um, but 
so yeah, that I, I would say something along those lines. I would say your book, if, if your book can't be understood except in one language, and all, these are the only guys who, who, who are capable of looking at it, then it's useless to most mankind. I'd point out all the people from the time of Muhammad down to the present who did speak Arabic and who thought it was complete, utter, total garbage. There's plenty of them, starting with the starting with the Meccans of his time. It's in the Quran over and over again. Muhammad receives a revelation. They go, these are just tales of the ancients. You're stealing this from other people. We know the guy you're stealing all of this from, right? So they thought his his revelations were were a joke. Uh, Islam didn't really start growing until Muhammad started promising people, hey, if you join me, you fight for me, then we'll go out and we'll divide up the spoils of war. We'll take all the stuff, and if you die in battle, great, you get to go to you get to go to heaven and get all your virgins and spend eternity deflowering little girls. What a sick religion! <laughs> what a sick religion! You think you're gonna? You think, this is your defense of your religion, but it only works in one language. Well, great, it's useless. It's so useless. All right, <laughs> more tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen, one way or another. Catch y'all then.